Hey, I'm Beth Sussman. And I'm Howard Bloom, and this is The Alarmist. Alarmist. Howard Bloom, who is a legend in the public relations business, he's represented people like Michael Jackson, the Talking Heads, Cindy Lauper, Prince. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And Beth Sussman, who is an amazing musician who's played with everybody from Whitney Houston and was the musical director for Bette Midler. This is an amazing show. Let's bring them on. Beth Sussman, Howard Bloom, welcome to The Alarmists. <laughs> Thanks, hey. Jesse. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> How is everybody today? Hey, stranger. Hey, old friend. God, hey, Jesse, I friend. know you for a long, long time. That's right, Pat. We go back to, uh, blah, 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 blah. I won't mention the years. <laughs> we go back there. We go back over 30 years. Yeah, 30 years. That's right. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, to, both of you play in your are, band. That's right. You were in my band. That's right. When I had a band. You see, Howard, we... Inside Astonishing. everyone is a musician. Uh, you know, we all want to be on that stage. Right. Now my stage is at home with my kids, you know. Um, both of you have a very unique view of the entertainment world. Um, it's very interesting because, Howard, you know, you've had to be sort of like the uh, armchair psychologist to some of the greatest entertainment names in the world. And in a way, bet you too. You know, you're you're also an armchair psychologist in a way. Very much so. You are the conduit to greatness, to bringing these top performers to the peak of their, you know, to the peak of their game. I want to get into, you know, what it's like to be you. You know, what it's like to work with these big iconic names, some of them legends, some of them who've departed and left us. Um, let's start. Let's start. Ladies first, Howard. Let's start with that. Tell me a little bit about your, you know, your history. Give the audience a little background check about where you come from and what makes you so spectacular. Um, well, spectacular, that's an awfully large word to use about me. Uh, Jesse's such a small individual, but I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I've been in this business for, for um, decades and decades, uh, 40, over 40 years, and uh, I feel... Uh, lucky. I feel blessed. You know, I think I came up in the best time in music in New York, mm -hmm. except if you went back another, you know, 20, 60s, the years. 60s. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm talking like, like, you know, the 40s, the 50s, with, mm -hmm. you know, the great jazzers, you know, bebop. Um, yeah, exactly. That yeah. would have, that would have been an amazing time to be in New York too. You know, when, uh, um, 50 was 50th street, 52nd street. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, funny that, how we, how a lot of us aspire not to the present, but to the times that we don't have anymore. You know, no, just, no, I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here saying that, like, I, I get, I work with a lot of. I mean, I work with a lot of musicians that, um, when, when we worked um, with a lot of musicians that are younger than I am, you know, and they were like, oh, tell me the stories about, like, you know, come being in New York in the '70s. Yeah, that was you know, definitely. Was, New York was like New York was it in the '70s. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for music. And so, and I came up, you know, I moved into the city after I went to college, went to Oberlin College for one year, came back to the city to study with a, the great Sanford Gold, who uh, really, um, really turned, you know, you actually universalized everything that I had done before that, said it's all music, it's all the same thing, you know, showed me in five minutes, you know, a, something that, that made me go, um, hmm. He's right, you know. So you know um, what's you know what's amazing about you also. You're an incredible musician, but you're also a great communicator, and that's oh. what I've always liked about you. You you speak your mind. You always you know you always know where you stand when you talk to you. And mm -hmm. and you know when you're working like you like I don't know if people know, but you know you work with Whitney Houston on one of the greatest records ever made. You know yep. I will always love you, the Dolly Parton song. You were a big part of that. Tell the viewers about that experience. Well, it's a funny. It's actually a funny story because um, you know she was down in Florida at the Fountain Blue. They were shooting uh, shooting that scene. That was it was a live. If you remember the movie, mm -hmm. it was a, a live. She was in a. You know, it was live in a club, and um, she said, and they wanted her to do it live, and she said, "I'll do it live if you let me have my band." So they said okay, and they put it down, and. Um, 
we met and and then we ended up recording we ended up backstage and i my joke is that they took one look of one took one look at us and said hmm, maybe not on camera so we were backstage with out. david foster david foster was producing it and we did play it live with her of course uh -huh. um no i think that that was the vocal they used was her vocal that day they did they did replace a few things or fix a few things in LA, but um, I think that was her vocal from that day. Mm -hmm. And that was definitely the, my piano part from that day. But um, that was, you know, it was, it was on, a, I mean, we just, we thought we were going to be on camera. We thought we were going to be in the scene and it just, it turned out, you know, we were just wearing you jeans. You were on the cutting room floor. But it was like we were in, <laughs> no, we weren't even dressed. <laughs> they just, they said Typical no. Typical musicians. <laughs> they said no before we even, you know, before they even had the opportunity to dress us. They went, nah, maybe not. So. Yeah. Now, Howard, I mean, you have worked with everybody from the Talking Heads and Cindy Lauper and Michael Jackson and Prince. You definitely have to be an armchair psychologist. I've interviewed Prince. In fact, I've interviewed all these people that I just mentioned, except Michael. And this, they're a complex group. Maybe David Byrne, the most easygoing of the, of the people I've ever interviewed. Well, What's David Byrne, secret? The, the secret is I started in theoretical physics and micro, microbiology at the age of 10. At the age of 12 and 13, I became fascinated with what I call the gods inside of us, with the ecstatic experiences with the incredible passions that take you over. When you go in front of an audience, you feel the eyes of the audience widening, you feel their pupils dilating, you feel their faces melting, you feel them melting into one giant uh, amoebic-like blob of energy, whether it's 700 people or 70,000 people, and you feel that energy go through you as if it's going through a pseudopod. Or a pipe, and you become. You sound an empty more like pipe. a scientist than a public relations expert. <laughs> well, but this is like the ultimate ecstatic experience because that energy of those seven hundred or seven seventy thousand people goes flowing through you, goes flowing to something around your brain. You have an out of body experience. You think you're watching the whole thing from a spot on the ceiling. You watch as your body is danced like a puppet for the next seventy minutes with that inner audience energy coming through you. What you do is the expression of the audience's awe and wonder. You are their tongue. You are, in a sense, their voice. And it's an astonishing, stunning experience. So I became aware of that when I was 13 years old. I wanted to take the tools of my science and use those tools to understand the gods inside of us. And ultimately, through a series of I love of that line, the gods inside of us. Where yes. did you get that from? I got it. It came from me. Um, it rose in me at some God knows what point, but a long, <laughs> long time ago. Pun intended. So, that, so that's what I was hunting down. And I managed, through a series of accidents, I managed to get into the dark underbelly where new myths and movements are made, which had been one of my goals, and founded, without knowing anything about popular music initially, I founded the biggest PR firm in the music industry. And as you said, work with Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, ACDC, Aerosmith, Kiss, Queen, Run DMC, Billy Joel, Billy Idol, Paul Simon, Peter Gabriel, um, Shaka Khan, Joan Jett, ZZ Top, people oh like that, God. about 100 people like that, always searching for the gods inside of them, always trying to let them know that they had one personality that sits around and says, hello, how are you? Fine, thank you very much, and how are you? And an entirely different personality that emerges from them when they are kindled um, by the audience, when they catch fire in the eyes of the audience. So I would tell you, if you came to me for representation, if you want me to fashion an artificial mask and put it on you, call it an image, and say, kid, I'm going to make you a star, I'll send you to my best competitor. If you're going to work with me, you have to know that um, music is not an exchange of plastic, it is not an exchange of money, it is not an exchange of downloads. It is, it is an exchange of human soul. And if you work with me, I'm going to study you intently for six weeks. I'm going to come out to wherever you are, sit with you in your own environment with no handlers, no wives, no anything, but you and me in the room. And my job is going to be secular shamanism. Wow. To find those gods inside of you and introduce those gods to the hello, how are you? Wow, Fine, thank you, you are very one much prolific so. son of a gun. Oh, my God. <laughs> So now, let's talk about the divine Miss M, since this is a subject you both know intimately. 
Uh, Bet, why don't you talk about well, we, that? We one? also yes. have uh, Cindy Lauper in common. I did. Oh, that. you do. That's right. <laughs> I, I did. I did, uh, the, I, I did the um, She's So Unusual, the anniversary, 30th anniversary of She's So Unusual tour. Neat. So I was out with her for two years. Um, All right. Like, around 13 to 2013 to 2015. And I also worked with her many years, uh, many years ago. Cindy is I an think, extraordinary I think I sang. person. I think Desmond Child and I sang on her on one of the Astonishing. Records. That's <laughs> astonishing. <laughs> and talk about well, what was your well, relationship I can, with I can tell you a story about Bet that gets across mm -hmm. this aspect of the gods inside. So one day, Bet was recording. She was um, shooting a film in New York City. It was her film with Lily Tomlin. I think it was called Big Business. And they were shooting at the entrance uh, to the Plaza Hotel. Um, I hadn't seen Bet in, in four or five months, so I went over to her dressing trailer um, just to say hello and, and gauge how she was doing. Well, I walked into the dressing trailer, and Bet was slumped on a banquet. Um, she looked like a bag lady. Bet is not really, she is, she is not a pretty woman. And uh, I said, Bet, how are you? And Bet said, oh, you know, I, I have a cold. Uh, I think I had a flu. And she proceeded to rattle off 15 or 20 symptoms. Um, and it was all kvetching. It was all complaints. <laughs> um, and meanwhile, there was a crew of 150 people crowded around the stairway to the Plaza Hotel, setting up cameras, setting up the microphone, setting up sound, setting up everything. And then you could hear Bet's call coming through the open uh, door of the, the trailer. And Bet got up out of her seat and stood up. And as she started walking toward the door, she grew in stature. And by the time she reached the bottom of the three stairs that led to the sidewalk, leading to those 150 people, that was as if she had 100,000 laser beams going off in her gut and her heart. She was astonishing. And then she went in front of at the center where the cameras were focused and where all the lights were focused down, whammo. She was the divine Miss M. It was wow. astonishing. So those are the gods the that I was hunting. And those are the gods I was trying to introduce to the self of everyday life. And you saw two entirely different Bette Midlers. The Bette Midler of her private life and the Bette Midler on stage. Totally. One, yeah. And Bette, if you saw her on Tribeca, where she had just bought uh, a duplex or triplex apartment when Tribeca was still basically a Didn't wasteland. No, if you, she was wearing a schmata, she was wearing a totally <laughs> inconspicuous dress. What is it about? Looked, what, are, what is it about us Jews with the word schmata? Wait a minute! I to say he's a little soft on the tea. <laughs> <laughs> he's a little soft on the tea. But you expected yeah, her to stop card. at every, you know, the big garbage barrels that are at the corner of every street. You expected her to stop at every single one and go through it looking for stuff other people have discarded. <laughs> that, that's how anonymous Bet looked. I mean, have oh. you had that experience? Well, she, um, she enjoys being normal. She enjoys trying to be normal. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, kn I remember when, uh, I mean, yes, the, I mean, the difference between her offstage and onstage, of course, she's miraculous. She gets on stage and, you know, and she's just all of a sudden you see all the uh, the 14 other uh, genius talents that, you know, you weren't even aware that she had. So, you know, once she's on the stage, she just, How did you guys meet, uh, Bet? How did you meet the Divine uh, Mark Shaman, when Bet, in, in 99, when Bet was uh, moving back to New York after the earth, big earthquake in L.A. Um, so she, she had enough. Well, she still has her place out there. She's got oh, a beautiful, okay. beautiful house out there. Yeah, but she just decided, but she was living full time there. She hadn't been living in New York at all. So she decided, all right, I got to go back there and I need a new you know, musical director. Um, so Mark Shaman, of course, her number one go-to told her to call me. You know, it's very interesting. You're both very big personalities. You have star-like qualities of your own because of those personalities. Thank but you. the key in working with any celebrity, I believe, is how you break down those walls so that you talk to each other like a human being. What is your secret in being able to do that? Because in order to work with somebody... Hang on, let me just turn this off so it doesn't ring in our... Okay. Right. What is... Uh, let's wait for Beth to come back. We can edit this out. Right here. Okay. Right here. Okay. No. So, what is that secret that you you can 
strip away the ego, strip away the fame thing, you know, and get right to, you know, tete-a-tete, -tete, being two human beings in the same room, no matter what that fame might be. Since we're talking with you, Beth, why don't you elaborate on that a little well, bit? Well, I think that when I, when I first met her, I mean, I think that I go into a meeting with her confident that, you know, I, I'm being recommended by somebody like, you know, Mark Shaman, who, uh, you know, I, I was confident going into the meeting. But also, you know, I think I had a very strong um, approach to what we were about to, what we were going to do, what the job was, you know. So you just said um, what you felt and you put it all out on the table. And I think she probably liked that, no? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that people like that really, you know, they, they really appreciate it's refreshing to them when somebody sits down in front of them and isn't just like, oh, 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 oh. right, right, right. You know? right. No and, bullshit. Yeah, just well, say it like you feel. Because, it. you know, you're not, and that I always used to tell her, you know, I said, because you're not paying me to tell you what you want to hear. You, you want me, you hired me because you want me to tell you what's, the truth. Uh, what's <laughs> happening. Yeah, what's really going well, at least on. what you believe to be the truth. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, we always had a, I think there was always a mutual respect. Did you ever get a chance to hang out we with her socially? Fight. We had one fight, and that's we had one fight, and that ruined us. Really. What was much. the fight about? Nothing. Yeah. Aren't it they always? Bad. Aren't they always? But <laughs> nothing happened. She thought it happened, and, and and unfortunately, because of that, you know, and sometimes she's very stubborn. And you never had a chance to to. To talk to her after that and to try well to we went back to work and you know we had a long break and then uh, we went back to work and we finished in vegas and that was the end and and she never forgave you for whatever the fight was mm, you know I, i've seen her since you know we we are you know we we like seeing each other when we see each other we were because not only were we um working together but we had become really good friends so wow it was wow. kind of a um you know, so it's not just a professional relationship that gets cut off. It's a friendship that gets lost. Exactly. exactly. That sucks. That yeah. sucks. Now, Howard, how do you work with a guy like Michael Jackson who comes with all that baggage? You know, I've heard that uh, – I've met Michael on a few occasions, and the person that we see on the camera and on screen is a very different guy in private when you're one-on-one -on -one with him. Talk about yeah. that a little bit and, and well, how you manage to navigate that. The, the first time I met Michael, I was at Marlon Jackson's pool house. The brothers, first the Jacksons pursued me, their managers pursued me for four months. And I kept saying no. Um, the, I don't do easy things and you'd be a talking dog to get on the phone and say Michael Jackson. And any magazine editor anywhere in the country would give you a cover in exchange for an interview. And then finally the managers said, uh, well, uh, the Jacksons are coming into New York. Um, they want to meet with you. Well, I had heard that to be a mensch, you don't just, and you if you want to say no to somebody, you owe them the respect of saying no to their face. So I went in to see them, and it was four of the most decent, honest guys I'd ever met in my life, and they were in serious trouble of some kind, and trouble is what I work on. So we became like family. So we were standing at Marlon Jackson's pool house. A pool house is a little building just big enough for one room on the first floor and one room on the second floor. And the door, we were at there, the room was, uh, the walls were crowded with video arcade games. At the center of the room, there was a pool table. The brothers had me in the middle and they were crowded around me. And we were looking at uh, potential t-shirts and potential jackets for merchandising. And I heard the door open. Now I had read literally a thousand articles, a stack that thick of uh, articles about Michael. And they all said he was a bubble baby. And if you put your hand out to touch him, he would shrink away in fear. So when the door started to open, I knew it was Michael. I walked over and I stuck out my hand and I said, hi, I'm Howard. And Michael stuck out his hand and he said, hi, I'm Michael. And it was a slightly lighter handshake than usual, but it was a normal human handshake. I told him I wanted to read him a press release um, and get his approval on it. He said, let's go upstairs. Upstairs was one room crowded to the ceiling with amplifiers and keyboards. <laughs> um, he sat on one amp. I sat on another amp. I started reading him this press release. Now, look, I had been working on my writing since I was the age of 12. I had been obsessed with my writing. I had edited the literary magazine at NYU, and we had won two National Academy of Poets prizes. I was serious about this stuff. 
And I read the first two sentences and Michael slumped in his chair and he went, oh. And I read him two more sentences and he slumped a little bit more and he went, oh. And when I finally got to the end, he said, man, that's beautiful. Did you write that? <laughs> Michael Jackson <clears throat> was the only human I had ever met who saw the art in those sentences, who saw the art behind the craft of writing something as simple as a press release. Then we went downstairs. There was a meeting with the art director from CBS. She came. She brought four of the most gorgeous portfolios you've ever seen. She slid the first one across the table at us. Again, the brothers were crowded around us. Michael was at my right elbow. His shoulder was up against my right shoulder. And his left hey, knee hey, was, hey, up hey, against, uh, was up against my left knee. And um, he opened just an inch of the first portfolio page. And he went, oh. And his knees began to buckle and he opened it another couple of inches and he went, oh, and his knees buckled even further. Oh, 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 Michael Jackson was having he was having an aesthetic orgasm right there in front of my eyes. Now, I got into science at the age of 10 because two rules of science captured my imagination. One is the truth at any price, including the price of your life. And the second one is look at things right, on, right under your nose as if you've never seen them before, and then proceed from there. Look for things that are invisible to you and everybody around you. Bring them into visibility and then proceed from there. The second law, the first law is the law of courage. The second law is the law of awe, wonder, and surprise. Michael saw the infinite in the tiniest swatch of that first picture. He saw more in that swatch than the artist himself had ever seen. It was William Blake's seeing the infinite in a grain of sand seeing the world in a grain of sand, that second law of science, look at things right under your noses if you've never seen them before. It was that very principle come to life in a way I had never imagined in my lifetime. So Howard, and, so Howard, when you when you have had such an incredible, you know, period of time with Michael and got to know him and you see all this crazy stuff that's come out, accusing him of being a pedophile and then this movie that, you know, the documentary that came out, What's your response to all that, since you knew him better than most people? I was horrified by the documentary. Did you have um, any clue? Did you have any clue that this was going on? Did he ever? No, and I really seriously doubt that it was going on, because Michael's bedroom was a public place. When Lionel Richie, another one of my clients, went over to Michael's to write We Are the World with him, where did they go? They went to Michael's bedroom. They lay on the floor like two kids. At a certain point, Lionel felt something at eye level, which means a foot and a half off the floor, staring him in the eye, and he turned his head very slowly, and it was uh, Michael's boa constrictor muscles sizing him up as an afternoon snack. Um, <laughs> that's the nature of Michael Jackson's bedroom. It's a it's a public place. You sure and, it wasn't and, a lawyer? <laughs> uh, and and then the trick is that that Michael never had a childhood. He started rehearsing seriously when his, with his brothers when he was six. He was performing in major theaters when he was nine years old. He was for performing for kings and queens by the time he was 11. So he's suffering from childhood deprivation. And you know that first- And, a, and, and, and an abusive father, according to what we've read. And, and, but he never talked about that. Their brothers never talked about that. The only thing about their father that bothered them was when they went to their father's office at Motown Records and they, find their, they found their father stripping the secretary on the desk. And then they chased him around the block. They were ready to beat the bloody hell wow, out of him. Wow, wow, but wow. that was the only complaint they had about their father. You've and had an extraordinary, you've had an extraordinary life, Howard Bloom. I, I hope you're not done yet because listening to you speak, it just sucks you in. And I'm so glad you're on the show today. Um, Thanks, I wanna, Jesse. Before we end, I want to bet. Bet. I've always. We were talking earlier about music. We're done and already. Well, no, we still have a little more time. I'm, I'm giving you some time to talk about your amazing new show that you're doing, which combines music and food. Oh, thank you for that, Jess. I had forgotten for a second. Um, no. Tell the audience, tell, okay, tell so us, because I, know, I, I always it. think so music and food year, go together. You know, I've had this career for a really long time, and uh, I love doing music, and I really love doing other things. Like, I'm a complete tennis fanatic, love to watch, love to play, but I'm... I'm uh, I'm crazy fool in the kitchen. I love to cook, and I've always thought that music and food went together. And I never saw a show 
I never saw a TV show or anything that really uh, put across this concept in the way I see it. And so I had come up with this idea years ago when I was with Whitney. So this would have been back, you know, in the uh, 80s, 90s. And um, so the idea was to get him have a musical guest on, um, promote something that they were doing without getting into the whole uh chronology of what the show would be. It's basically interview. We talk about something they're promoting. We talk about their love. Tell the audience what the name of it is. It's called Bet's Diner. Bet's Diner. Not to be it. mistaken with Bet's um, Ocean View Diner, but because there's a whole season, I think there's like 11 episodes on YouTube if you wanted to check it out. So Absolutely. Anyway, so we, we cook, we interview, we taste the food, and then we go over to the piano and we do a song. And that was it with, you know, with, with all of my guests. And I had, I had Janice Siegel on from Manhattan Transfer. I had Mark Rivera, saxophone. Yeah, from Billy Joe. From everybody, yeah, who's an yeah. Old, uh, dear old friend of mine. Anyway, so I'm, uh, I'm going, I'm working on a second season of that. Uh, because who, are your guests, who are the guests who, that you're trying to line up? Who knows when we're going back to work, us musicians. Um, well, I know that I'm going to probably have Brenda Russell very dear mm -hmm. friend of mine because apparently Brenda has written a song called dinner alone. Oh, the, so the, I, the show is going to be called the season is going to be called dinner for one, which was inspired <laughs> by, you know, by all this time that we've all been home during the, uh, during the plague, during the, uh -huh. and, and I mean, everybody I know has been spending twice as much time in the kitchen than they had. Oh my you know. God. If my wife has to cook another meal, She's I know. Trying all I went out to dinner for the first time on Friday night. I actually, it was like sort of normal. Somebody served me a martini and delicious food. And, you know, everybody had masks and gloves on. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's, that's odd. But I um, can't get used to it. I still, I'll, I'll never get used to that. Oh my God. Now I'm going to close the show. show. It, it happens to be a, you know, I didn't, I didn't mind it. Oh, I'm let me just toss show. in one word. And that is uh, my seventh book is out. It's called Einstein, Michael Jackson, and Me, A Search for Soul in the Power Pits of Rock and Roll. It's about my rock and roll experiences. It's about this hunt for the gods inside. It has gotten phenomenal reviews. Who's the and, publisher? Uh, it's uh, Backbeat Books, which is a part of Roman and Littlefield. And the book is available on Amazon. It's available everywhere, but everywhere is closed right now. So Amazon yeah. and Barnes & Noble Online are the two only places you can get books these days. Yeah. Howard, where are you from? I'm from Buffalo, New York. Okay. But I've lived in New York City since 1964. So no, this is. I was growing up, and uh, I wondered if. Uh, Does he look familiar, <laughs> Bet? Does he look yeah. familiar? Yeah. <laughs> Do you owe our money, Howard? Come on. <laughs> right. Well, we, we're we're types. We're all types. Um, yeah, and you have your name on your jacket. I like that, Howard. Yes, that, that helps. Good. Yes. Well, then you won't ever forget who you are. That's a good thing. Right, exactly. <laughs> oh, and Your there's a new boy. film about my life. It's oh, called no, uh, The Grand Unified Theory of Howard Bloom. It's a 66-minute film. It's won uh, Best Picture at the Design Science Film Festival. It's been shown at a bunch of other film festivals and has another one coming up in Italy where they can still have film festivals, the not film festival. And it's available online as of last Tuesday. Fantastic. As a closing yeah. statement, I want to hear from each of you where you see us and where you see the entertainment world a year from now. What do you think we'll be doing? A little more of this or you think things will get better? Um, I think that, you know, I think that people will start to play live this summer. I think that I, I sort of hear a little bit about the, of that now. As far as, you know, where we're going to be, I don't know. Everything is, keeps getting canceled. So I think that everybody's, I think that everybody's paranoia is, is um, duly noted and justified um, because it's, I don't, I don't think we're going to be done with this for a long time. So yeah. I think that we're going to be online. I think that like people are playing and on docks and people, you know, on boats are coming to see them play. That's what I'm hearing about. Southside Johnny just played in the Hamptons this past July 25th. Where did he play? On the Great Lawn over here in West Hampton. Right. And everybody was in their car and, you know, but, you know. Right. It was a little daunting. I saw some, you know, video taken and people were sort of trying to social distance. And that's the problem with the whole social distance thing and wearing the mask. 
we all want to get back to normal and all it takes is one person to just let that guard down. Exactly. It's like the whole mask thing. It's like, you know, I've said it from the beginning. I mean, I got sick. I had the COVID in April and I got it when I, when I was wearing a mask and gloves and the whole wow. thing does not work unless everybody's doing it. So yep. you hear, wow. I really believe that. And when you hear, um, you know, Fauci or whomever, Dr. Fauci and, or uh, Redfield, is that his name? The guy, the CDC? Yes. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. You know, when they just say, you know, we think that if everybody just if everybody did this for six weeks, we could really get a handle on it. And it's That's, so yeah. difficult. You know, I heard you in your last segment, you know, talking about, you know, talking to people about their rights yeah, you know, about. Exactly. And I think about when I hear people say, you know, their freedoms being taken away from them by having Bullshit. to wear. And I say, you know whose people are, you know whose fucking freedoms have been taken away from them? The 147,000 people who died, exactly. their freedoms have been taken away from them. They've got no more freedoms. As far as your freedoms, you know, this is that a self That went out the window act. when this pandemic arrived. The world I don't we know live what in it's going to take to watch this and realize that this is so real. You know, and so serious. So and look, and look we're, we're older. We're older. We have to be even more careful. And you don't even know if you can get it again. We, we, we don't know about the antibodies right. and how long it, it protects us, if it protects us at all. Yeah. We know. Don't know. Howard and you, how do you see the world in the music business, the entertainment world and, and life in general? You're from well, there. life in general, it's going to stay bad for a long time. The Spanish flu of 1918 lasted four years. The first wave came in March, just like our first wave. Um, then the summer, things were looking better. Um, then October, the second wave hit, and far more people died in the second wave than had died in yeah in the first wave. Mm -hmm. And there, there were a total there were a total of three four waves of it over two years. That's what we seem to be in for, especially given the quality of leadership in the White House right now, which uh, the president is the best ally that the uh, coronavirus has ever had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you, uh, do you think he's going to get reelected in, in uh, November? Oh, you think I think there's a good chance of it. Mm -hmm. If there's a good chance he'll be reelected, there's a good chance that there's a big secret vote of people who won't tell pollsters that they're going to vote for Donald I Trump. Agree. They're ashamed I of it. Agree. And well, uh, we're going to have to. Two years, four years ago. That's why. Um, yeah. Four years ago. Yeah. That's why. He, right. Is, you know. Yep, so um, the Democrats are going to have to, and that includes me, are going to have to work our asses off in order to give a landslide victory, because even if he loses, Donald Trump is going to claim that he lost because of fraud and he's not going to leave the White House. Right. He wants Why a dynasty. Joe Biden? He, he, he's, there's, he, there's so many better choices out there. Why Joe Biden? That's a good question, probably because he has a name value. Um, and the American public, remember, the Democrats in the primary elections overwhelmingly voted for Joe Biden. So who knows? It's a return to normalcy. As he says, as Joe Biden says, we want the soul of America back. And right now, the soul of America is being trashed and slashed in every conceivable way. I think how long do you think it'll that... take for if, if we do get a Democratic president in there? How long do you think it'll take to restore some some class and dignity and 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 semblance to the Oval Office and to the image that America they, has. I don't think it, I don't think that is what takes a long time. I think that once this guy is out of there, you know, I think that it's kind of almost going to be automatic that there's going to be some semblance of normalcy and class just by the mere dismissing of him. You know, I think there's so many though. I mean, it's like, a, that's another phenomenon. There are just so many people that more than you realize. I just that, think that there's a lot of things, other things that have to, I think that, you know, we have to get, we have to roll back all these uh, rollbacks that were, you know, what what he's done for, as far as, um, you know, the, uh, everything that Obama did as far as um, rolling back, um, whatchamacallit's. Uh, Come on, you can do it, Pat. You know the word, you know the word. Um, <laughs> We having a moment? <laughs> I'm having a senior moment, yeah. Well, well it's going to be hard. Know. In particular, it's going to be hard to get back our international standing. We were the undisputed leader of the Western Alliance. The Western Alliance is now in disarray because um, Donald Trump has done everything in his power to kick, to kick it apart. Um, 
and yeah. the country, the rest of the world does not trust us. They think we, we are the nation that voted into office a man who said, why don't we just inject bleach into yeah. everybody? <laughs> and they're laughing at us for that. Oh my God. So they don't trust our, they don't, don't trust think, our judgment. Don't you think they feel sorry for us to a certain extent as well? Yes, absolutely. I, I definitely think so. That's yeah. why I think that some of that is not going to take that long. It's the but, other stuff. And regulations is the word I was looking for, rolling back all the regulations. But the you problem know. is, the problem is there are a lot of people. The most important aspect of this is the electoral college. You notice how we never hear anything about the electoral college? We don't even know how it works. We don't even know how the people that, get, that, are, that are representing each state get elected. Why is that? Why is it a big secret? I, I just think that, you know, we can hear all these people, you know, the American people say how much they're upset and everything. But at the end of the day, it's those people in the Electoral College that are going to decide what goes down. Well, and MSNBC has Steve Karnacki. Steve Karnacki is brilliant at explaining statistics, polls. Yes. Um, and Steve Karnacki in every episode now tells you what the implications of the polls are for the Electoral College. So the Electoral That's College good. has made it onto the map of our perceptions. Great, great. That needs to be done. Needs yeah. to be done. Yeah. Hey, it was really, really great to have you both on the show. I really enjoyed hearing both of your stories and, and, and your take on things. And I'm telling you, you guys are doing great stuff. Don't stop. Thanks, Jess. You too. All right. And stay Hello. safe. And uh, I'll let you guys know when this is going to air. All right. All right. All right. Have a great, have out. a great night. Okay. You bye. Too. Good great to meet you, Matt. Yeah, you too. All right. Love you both. Be well, everybody. Another episode of the Alarmist Conspiracy Theories and Coffee comes to a close with the great Beth Sussman and Howard Bloom, public relations musician and artist extraordinaire. We got into it. All these great famous icons. The world has gone, been turned upside down, and the world might not ever be the same again. But we're trying to hold out hope. Tune in and watch this latest episode, and let's see if we can make something of this. Everybody stay safe. Be careful. Peace.